Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. The Spark theme for February is Child Health Research. I'm Paula Robeson, your host for the next hour. Children's Healthcare Canada acknowledges that our offices, located in Ottawa, are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. And we also recognize the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community, our province, and the country. We're delighted to speak today with Dr. Peter Gill and Francine Buchanan, who will be delivering uh, the webinar, Delivering High Quality Care in Pediatric Research Through Patient and Family Engagement. Before we begin, we invite you to answer a few quick poll questions for us. Please note that you'll have to answer all three questions to submit your response. I see Jose has the uh, poll questions up. Uh, we thank you so much for participating. Um, while you're answering those questions, I will introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Peter Gill is a general pediatrician and an associate scientist at the Sick Kids Research Institute. He's an associate assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of, of Toronto and a senior associate at the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on improving the care and outcomes for hospitalized children in the general pediatric inpatient unit. He co-founded and is vice chair of the Canadian Pediatric Inpatient Research Network, or PERN, a network of children's and community hospitals across Canada that conducts outcome-based and patient-oriented research to improve outcomes for hospitalized children. Francine Buchanan is a family research advisor who has partnered with clinical investigators to share her lived experience as the mother to a son with medical complexity. She currently holds the position of program manager, patient and family engagement research at SickKids. Tasked with developing partnerships between researchers, patients, and families to ensure research is conducted with the patient and family voice as a key driver. Francine holds a master's in library science and a PhD from the University of Toronto's Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. During this presentation, we welcome you to converse in the chat box, type your questions in the question and answer box, and I'll pose relevant questions throughout the webinar or at the end. It's now my pleasure to pass the mic to Peter Gill. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's, it's great to, to be here today. Um, before we start, we want to acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet uh, is historically the home of Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. For thousands of years, the land on which we reside has been, has been the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be, to be present in this territory and for the opportunity to share this land. So thanks for the kind introduction, Paul. And, and before we get on, we wanted just to speak a little bit further um, about ourselves. So as Paula mentioned, I'm a general pediatrician and clinician investigator. And what this practically means is that I spend about three months of the year taking care of hospitalized children um, at sick kids, as well as running a half day clinic. Um, and then the rest of my time I spend focusing on doing research 
which aims to improve how we care for those same children which I care for um, in the hospital setting. And I'll pass it over to Francine. Thank you, Peter. And I'm Francine Buchanan. I'd like to start by saying first and foremost, I'm a proud parent to an amazing 10 year old. Cristiano's experiences in the hospital and in clinics afterwards led me towards being a research family advisor first, then really focusing on patient engagement and how we can do it better. And then looked at uh, studying shared decision-making for families exactly like ours. I like to say that my combination of experiences has really centered and focused me on recognizing the value that patient and family voices bring to the research we do. And I hope today we can share some examples of that with you. Thanks, Francine. So for our talk today, we have three main objectives. So we hope that following this webinar, participants will be able to understand the value of incorporating patient perspective in research, especially related to patient prior to prioritization of research. Um, we want to describe the important priorities for research in hospitalized children and to learn how individuals can access resources to, in terms of how to engage with patients and families to conduct research. We really hope that this talk is a useful example on why engaging with patients and caregivers can lead to high impact and meaningful output. So before we start, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the setting of care that, that I practice in. And these are some photos of the general pediatric inpatient unit um, or the general pediatric ward at, at SickKids, which is a, a distinct setting of care that's separate from other specialty wards, such as the oncology ward, the cardiology, or in the neonatal intensive care unit. While these photos show an empty ward, this was certainly not the case this past fall when we experienced a massive surge of hospital admissions, mostly for acute viral illnesses. And many of these children were cared for on the general pediatric units. General pediatric wards take takes care of children of all ages, from newborns to teenagers. And the types of conditions that are cared for include previously healthy children that are hospitalized for conditions like bronchiolitis or pneumonia or asthma, also with children with chronic conditions like epilepsy are managed, and also with children with medical complexity, such as a child with cerebral palsy and a gastronomy tube are usually hospitalized. The general pediatric ward is usually the largest unit um, in children's hospitals. For example, here at SIGIDS, we have anywhere from 50 to 90 patients that are hospitalized at a time. And in Canada overall, over 20% or over a fifth of all hospital admissions in children um, are on general pediatric ward. And it's also important to point out that a large number of children are in hospital are cared for outside of children's hospitals. For example, in Toronto, we have over a dozen community hospitals in the surrounding community, which play a really important role in managing hospitalized children. However, despite being such a large area of care, um, we, there really is a lack of high quality research focused on the care of children on general pediatric wards. Compared to other specialty areas, there are few randomized controlled trials, which are the highest quality evidence. And many of the studies are traditionally what we would consider lower quality studies. And there also are, is a, are a large number of barriers to connecting research, particularly given the, the array of conditions that we care for. But every day, there are lots of questions that come up and we don't have a simple or streamlined way on how to answer them and how to improve the care of hospitalized children. To address these major knowledge gaps, several of us came together and launched the Canadian Pediatric Inpatient Research Network, or PERN, in 2019 to generate scientific knowledge to, how to improve the outcomes of hospitalized children on the general pediatric ward. And this is through the conduct of multi-center patient-oriented research. PERN includes hospital sites um, at all academic children's hospitals across Canada from Vancouver to St. John's and several large community hospitals in Ontario. And this is one of the photos of the number of representatives who attended our inaugural meeting in 2019. And from the outset, we included patient partners um, at our meeting, as well as other allied healthcare professionals, such as nurses. At our inaugural meeting, we had several keynote presentations from other exemplar research networks, such as the Emergency Department Network and then in the NICU, and from several important stakeholders, such as the Ontario Sports Support Unit and Children's Healthcare Canada, really helping to guide us and teach us about the importance of partnering with knowledge users and with patients. And at the outset, we've focus on embedding patient partners into our network. 
at our inaugural meeting, we sought to define our mission, our vision, and our values. Our mission is that we work with children and families to generate evidence that improves the care and outcomes of hospitalized children in general pediatric settings. And we, we build research capacity through mentorship and through collaboration. Our vision is to achieve the best quality of care and health outcomes for children that are hospitalized in general pediatric settings. And our values include um, things such as excellence, child and family centered, inclusivity and collaboration. But after we founded our research network, um, we had several important questions, which is what should we focus on? What should our priorities be? And this answer really depends on context and objective, but research priorities are helpful in terms of that they provide a set of specific concrete tasks to achieve over a fixed period of time. They are strategic to focus energy on certain priorities given the limited funding environment. And they also help to provide transparency on projects or the types of projects that a network will focus on. And they don't need to be exclusive, but they help to provide a specific direction. There are several different ways that one can identify priorities. They can be done informally, such as focusing on areas that individuals have strengths based on, on, on skill sets or based on funding calls or arbitrarily. There also are formal ways to identify priorities, such as using you know, the burden of illness, uh, cost to the, to the healthcare system, variation in care, evidence gaps. And there are also consensus methods um, to identify priorities. So for our newly launched research network, we took a two-pronged approach to identify priorities using formal methods. First, we sought to connect the James Lind Alliance Party Setting Partnership to identify important areas that have evidence gaps, but that are also patient-informed, which I'll speak about a bit further. But we also wanted to look at the data to identify areas that have major burden of illness and a major cost to the healthcare system. And today I'll speak mostly about the approach that we took using the James Lind Alliance Party Setting Partnership. Um, but we've done a lot of work looking at the data as well. So the James Lind Alliance is a not-for-profit making initiative, which was launched in the UK in 2004, which aims to bring together patients, caregivers, and clinicians together in what are called priority setting partnerships. These priority setting partnerships aim to identify and prioritize evidence uncertainties or unanswered research questions that patients and clinicians agree are the most important for their clinical area. And this method of priority setting was first developed when several individuals noticed a mismatch between research that is conducted and research that is needed by patients and clinicians. And one of the earliest examples is when patients and practitioners were asked about research priorities focused on osteoarthritis of the knee, there was very little interest in developing new medications, but rather a focus on the impact of physiotherapy of surgery and of helping people cope and function with a chronic disabling condition. When I was completing my PhD um, in the UK at the University of Oxford, it was around the same time that the Jim Lind Alliance was launching. Now the opportunity to see some of the earliest partnerships um, being launched and developed. And this approach really struck, st really struck with me as, um, and stuck with me as a, a great way to partner with patients to identify what are important areas to focus on. In the summer of 2019, which was, we were a bit fortuitous um, at the launch of our network that there was a funding call from the Canadian Institute of Health Research or CIHR, which aimed to focus on projects with brought together researchers, patients, knowledge users and decision makers around a specific research project. And it was a, a catalyst grant funding. And this really was the perfect opportunity for PERN, a newly launched network um, to connect a party setting partnership. So we worked hard with our newly launched network to establish a large number of partners and relations with different individuals, including the children's hospitals across Canada, community hospitals, and several relevant organizations, such as the Canadian Pediatric Society um, and others. But we also had a number of engagement partners in terms of, from the patient and knowledge user perspective, including the Kids Can Young Persons Advisory Group, the CHEO and Sick Kids Research Family Advisory Councils. And this is actually where I had the opportunity and pleasure at first meeting Francine as myself as a new researcher um, starting off at, at, at Sick Kids was really trying to understand and learn you know, how do I partner with patients to conduct research. I reached out to our Sick Kids Research Family Advisory Council 
um, really just with my question of how do I form partnerships? And then I met with Francine, who was co-chair at the time. And I explained our motivations, our aims of what we we're trying to do and really asked for help. And we were given the opportunity to present our, our study idea to the Research Family Advisory Council and received really invaluable feedback. And this is where I formed a, a lifelong friendship with Francine and working, working relationship with her. And this process of really recognizing that, that I need help, and I don't know how to do something, but I, I want to learn, really played an important role for our network in forming really key relationships with, individu with individuals. And for those in the audience, patient family advisory councils and these other organizations are really great starting places when seeking to partner with patients um, for projects. We were fortunate that we were successful and we were awarded our CIHR grant. And actually, interestingly, we were the, the top ranked application in the overall funding pool, which I think is a testament to the strong partnerships that we had developed and the important need for our work. And this flowchart outlines at a high level what a partner setting partnership is and what the steps are. The first step is to establish a steering group, which oversees the overall partnership. So I'll talk to you in a second. The next phase is to identify unanswered research questions from patients, caregivers, and clinicians across Canada. Then we check the evidence to, to determine that, that what the questions that were submitted were not already, actually, already answered by research in the first place, because the goal is to identify unanswered questions. Then we conducted an interim party setting part process, and then we had a final party setting partnership workshop where we identified a top 10 of the most important research questions. So the, one, of the, one of the really important points is that the overall steering group that oversees the process is formed a, a composed of equal number of patients and caregivers um, and clinicians. So this is a photo and, and, and many of you know, and this, is, this was occurred in the time of COVID. So all of our meetings were, were virtual, um, but our steering group, um, we had a, a James and Alliance consultant from the UK who was, who was super, who's supervised and overseen many partnership partnerships across Canada. We had two nurses who were part of um, the steering committee, which was really important given the important role that nurses play in the care for hospitalized children. We had two pediatricians, both representation from a community hospital and a children's hospital. And then we had three parents, caregivers, and one youth um, at our steering group. And these, these were the individuals that, that guided that our overall party setting partnership process. So the question that we posed at, at the first phase was, what are concerns, comments, or questions that you have about the care of children in hospital and the general pediatric ward that you would like answered by research? And we had nearly 500 responses from nearly 200 respondents from across Canada to these important questions. And as a side note, in developing our, our graphics and our communication strategy, we had reached out to you know, a local design student um, who helped us develop all of our graphics and communication plan just to ensure that we were um, tailoring it to a broad audience as well as to youth, which I think was a really um, invaluable um, help for us. So after going through the several steps, we had our final workshop. Um, and this is where we had two half days of a virtual session where we had 12 patients and caregivers and 12 clinicians from across Canada come together. And we truly had representation from um, across the map. We had a, a, a nurse from Yukon um, and from all the different areas. And this was really great where there was equal representation from both communities. And at this workshop is where the facilitator helped to essentially go through the short list of questions and in small groups the parents caregivers and youth and clinicians would talk and eventually come up with their ranking and it really was an amazing process to see and to watch um, each community hear the perspective of, of the other when trying to rank and prioritize um, these questions and, and many felt um, quite engaged throughout the whole process and these are the final top 10 unanswered research questions that were selected by that final um, workshop. You know, from the perspective of a pediatrician, you know, many of these are questions that resonate with us every day in hospital when we take care of hospitalized children. And I'll go through them um, from the perspective of a clinician and then I'll pass over to Francine to give her perspective. But you know, the first question that came, that was identified was what are the best practices and care models? for inpatient care for children and youth with medical complexity? Um, what are methods of communication that are most effective with inpatients um, and providers? What are the best practices and support strategies 
for Indigenous parents, families, and children in hospital? How can we ensure that the healthcare delivery in hospital meets the need of children and youth with developmental disabilities, for example, such as with autism? What are effective support strategies for parents and families in hospital? And also what are specific mental health supports that can be provided, which has come up as a major issue? What are effective ways that we can incorporate shared decision-making um, with parents and families in hospital? What are effective ways to mitigate the impacts of prolonged hospitalization? And also what are effective alternatives to shorten length of stay? And then lastly, what are the most effective communication methods between healthcare providers? And certainly many of these questions are, they're broad, they're challenging, but they certainly are the issues that are encountered every day in hospital and they're um, an important outline of what we need to do next. But now I'll pass over to Francine to take over and talk from the parent perspective. Thank you, Peter. And I agree, when I saw this list for the first time, um, just as Peter said, it really resonated with me. And I've been scrolling through as everyone's been introducing themselves and I kind of pose this question out to the group because there seem to be a lot of people in here that have multiple hats and dual roles. And really, if you think about it, do these, does this list resonate with you? When I look at this and I saw that this was a collaborative endeavor and this was a perspective that came together from both sides, my first thought was, well, of course these are important. Why didn't we think they were important before? I personally had seen these gaps in my experience in the healthcare system and I had seen these challenges, but I felt like I was facing them on my own which kind of led me to my next question or my next thought that popped into my head, which is why are these even still gaps? Why are they unanswered? When we look at the existing literature and we see that no one had come to solving these problems or researching these questions or had started, but had not come to something that was really, we could call evidence-based, that really stuck with me too. And I think, you know, one of the reasons is these are really tough questions. The path forward's not going to be easy, but at least now it looks like we have a map, right? These top 10 unanswered questions kind of give us a map forward on what we should be really looking at. And then secondly, the thing that really stuck out to me from this list is that what this list does is elevate the patient and family voice and validate that voice with that collaboration with the healthcare provider. We now look at this list and say, yeah, this is really important from all perspectives. And that importance of involving patients and families in research and how that perspective can help us better understand the type of research that's really gonna impact care that's what I wanna talk about today and hopefully give you some examples of how we've moved forward from this list and how we plan to tackle this list. But first I'm gonna take a bit of a step back and talk a little bit about how I came to my perspective. Go to the next slide. My journey here at Sick Kids, um, funnily enough, started almost uh, exactly 10 years ago this week. If I think about this time of the day 10 years ago, I was being rolled into the NICU for the first time, looking at my 910 gram little boy who was born at just 26 weeks gestation. I was terrified, disoriented, truly unsure of what was to come. Now, before my son was born, I'd had some, you know, fleeting experiences with healthcare, a few trips to the ER, maybe for a burn or a sprain you know, the regular trips to my GP, but nothing close to what the next few years would entail. I was not a nurse, I was not a doctor, and I was far from a health researcher at the time. I was just a regular person in the rat race, getting up every morning, going to work, and thinking about what I was gonna make for dinner. But during the next 16 months that my son spent in the NICU and PICU here at Sick Kids, the roller coaster ride was intense. We were thrown new diagnoses, sent new stuff to read, lots to learn. And it felt like every single day we were hit with either more bad news, a major decision to make, or some new information to consume. It's all in the part of healthcare. But those feelings of being cared for, 
sometimes fleeting. Some days were really good. Those days I would get a smile from my son. We would meet a milestone. Maybe he'd grain a few grams. Whatever was being done was working. We were happy. But then some days I would feel really bad. I'd be faced with a tough decision that I didn't feel like I knew enough to make that decision. I felt out of place. You know, people were telling me things they thought I should know, and I didn't, but I was too afraid to ask. A dear friend, Rachel, wrote an article about her experience as a parent in the healthcare system. And I think it perfectly captures my feelings from those many years ago. Rachel says, I felt like I was being dragged across the dance floor, confused and completely without guidance. Sometimes it felt like people assumed I knew the steps, or alternatively, someone else was just telling me the steps for me without having a say at all. That feeling of confusion, that feeling like I should know, but I did it, all of that didn't sit right with me. I knew I wasn't a healthcare professional, but I knew exactly how I felt. I knew those yucky days, those days we went home and cried, not because of a new diagnosis, but because of something someone had said or how I felt alone and unsupported. Those feelings existed because I experienced them. What I didn't know is that it didn't need to be that way. And what I definitely didn't know is that other parents felt that way too. Now the problem wasn't just the doctors, it wasn't the nurses on a personal level, it was that these experiences, even though they existed and I saw them, no one else thought they were important to address. They weren't a priority. They were just individual problems that each family addressed on their own in their own way. They weren't necessarily linked to outcomes as we think of. Now, how do I know this? Um, because when my son was discharged, I went back to school. I wanted to figure this out. I wanted to know if these yucky feelings I was, ha was having should matter. And if we should invest more time in researching. Now, as I sat next to the doctors and nurses and pharmacists that were in my classes, I learned about the research they were doing. And I learned how we base all our research on prior research. We build on, expand on those thoughts that had been done before. The problem was a lot of the voices of patients and families were barely included in the past. And now we need to start including the vo those voices and we're gonna talk, tackle the problems of the future. And that's why the JLA process was really a good starting point and really important because it validated those, those feelings, it validated what was important, and now we can take a step forward to tackle. Them. The priorities are just the first step. Let's get together and tackle them together. So this is what we have done so far. There's a lot of ways that we can engage patients. And what I plan to show you is all the various types of ways that we have already so that you can build on them and think of other ways that you can get into it as well. I will get at the end a little bit into how, but we could talk for hours about how to do engagement. This idea is to really spark your imagination that engagement is possible in the ways we can. So if we think about um, this first study, so this is actually, it's called Popcorn. It's a pan-Canadian clinical research platform. And the idea is to collect over a long term data on pediatric COVID cases. I was lucky to be brought in as a patient and family uh, advisor and engagement specialist early on in the development of this funding proposal. And the beauty of being brought in early on is that we were able to prepare for engagement and at least plan for it so that it was built into the structure of the study and the structure of the governance. And what that does is even if we don't know exactly how we were going to engage from the start, we had a structure in place so that we could easily engage in different places. And more important, we had a structure in place so that we knew where the challenges were arising and how maybe patient and family engagement could support that. So if we think about it, one of the areas is, that is always a challenge in studies is recruitment and data quality. Initially, when we thought about a planning for patient and family engagement, we thought um, you know, we would engage in some knowledge translation at the end, we would get them involved in the design, but we really hadn't thought about recruitment and data quality. 
as the study was being developed, we realized that this was really a great place to involve patients and families um, in preparing for high quality recruitment and data quality. So what we started with is we had patients and families involved in vetting, consolidating, and sometimes even eliminating some of the measures that were used. And we thought of it as, you know, it's a great to have really good quality measures, but if participants start stop filling them out halfway through because they're too long, your data quality just isn't there. So having patients and family advisors help us in terms of selecting the outcome measures, narrowing them down where possible and possibly eliminating them for that value versus burden um, balance. That's how we use patients and families. But we've also are working with patients and families right now to think about what are their information needs to decide if they wanna be a participant in this study and if they want to continue going into the long term. How do we keep them engaged in the study as participants? So we're actually engaging patients and families right now um, to figure out what their needs are, what experiences they've had from other studies they participated in, what did they like, what did they dislike, what did they want that they didn't have, so that we can use their past experience as a participant to inform how to make the participants in our study um, happier, more engaged, and continue with filling out the survey so we have high quality data. So my advice from Popcorn, where we started with just a couple of ideas of engagement, we've been able to grow into a lot. And the reason for that is early budgeting and planning and just building that infrastructure early on that says this is a priority within our study. Now, this also applies to how we're going to address the top 10 priorities. So if we look at the next slide, we can think about how we want to start right from the beginning. So priority one, what is the best practice and or care models that exist for inpatient care for children and youth with medical complexity being cared for on general peace? One of the things we're starting to do, um, a PER network member in Calgary, Dr. Tammy DeWan, is partnering with parents of CMC to conduct a systematic review of existing research into those experiences of CMCs while on the general PEDS floor. Now, many family advisors aren't even aware of what a systematic review is, and many investigators don't even consider involving family advisors in doing it. But their insight, that family caregiver insight can be invaluable in developing the scope of a review and adding context to the finding. Another added benefit of partnering with families on systematic reviews is often trainees are involved in systematic reviews. And if you involve trainees and you show them the value of patient partnership, they will continue on and continue to value patient insight in the continuous work they move into the future. But not all of these priority questions need to start from scratch. We don't have to start just with a systematic review for all of them. Some of them we looked at existing research as well. So we're currently here at Sick Kids embarking on a study to develop a means of facilitating shared decision making for CMC. Now, for this study, we're involving parents in the process of designing a tool, an easy way to remember getting involved in the decision making process. It's called I Know to Grow, and it's actually a mnemonic. It's to remember the things you need. So what do you know? What do you need? What have you observed? And what do you want? And we can come up with these fancy mnemonics. They're great. But if we design them on our own and we don't have family involvement, they might not use it. They might not like it. It might actually not get put into practice. So before we think about how great we are and pat ourselves on the back, we're gonna involve patients and families, but bring them together with youth, healthcare providers, and the people involved in implementing these tools so that we can design something and make it much better. Co-designing, that process of being, building, bringing people together, just as Peter talked about as part of the JLA, it's beautiful to see the discussions, the negotiations, and the solutions that come out from just those interpersonal conversations that we're having. Now, 
I know to grow addresses priority one, but it also addresses priority seven. So priority seven really asks about effective ways of incorporating shared decision making. And I really want to talk about this next study because I think this is a really interesting way of incorporating this priority into existing research. So bronchiolitis is one of the most common reasons children are admitted to general peds. Lots of studies have looked at the best way to treat these children and getting fluids into them is one of the main interventions. When suffering from bronchiolitis, oral fluids can be unsafe and can lead to worse outcomes. So you can give fluid one of two ways. You can do an IV or you can do an NG. Now, traditionally you might look at, you know, which option is better? But research has already shown that they're pretty much equal in these two interventions. Now, if you've ever been a parent who's had their child poke for an IV or to put up their nose for an NG, you know that these two interventions can be handled very differently by kids. The problem is most of the time parents don't know that there is a choice or they aren't given the option of a choice. So even if you think of everything being medically equal an outcome the chance for parents to be involved in this decision allows you to consider outcomes that weren't initially considered, like that feeling of hunger, how the child is experiencing, past experiences children may have had with either POPs or NGs. So the experience is how we're involving parents in this. And Prefer study took the top 10, and it's because of the top 10 that that direction shifted a little bit from, you know, why do some doctors order an NG and others an IV? To do we even involve parents in that decision? And if so, what's the outcome? So Peter, I'm gonna throw it back to you to talk about you know, that shift in thinking as well. Um, thanks, Francine. That's that's great. I appreciate your background and sharing your story. And so as Francine mentioned, that um, we know we wanted to try and start to integrate these top priorities into specific research questions. And bronchiolitis was really a condition that I think many of us realized how important it was with healthcare system this past fall. And this specific study, the preferred study, is really trying to understand, um, you know, how we can in, in understand and incorporate shared decision making um, into routine practice. And the goal of this study is to help generate knowledge on shared decision making with parents in choosing between intravenous or nasogastric fluids when children are hospitalized. And in doing so, we hope that this can provide an example or exemplar study of how we can incorporate some of the questions um, that are fairly broad into specific conditions that help to help to generate you know, generalizable knowledge that we can apply into other, other conditions. This is a study that we're planning to launch at 15 hospitals across Canada, and we've got some initial funding to start at SickKids and Lake Ridge Hospital. So as Francine mentioned, there are several important evidence gaps that we want to try and focus on with this specific study. Um, and as we've discussed that there are you know, fairly, the studies have shown fairly similar evidence that both, not surprisingly, um, help children get hydrated. They give it just a different way. But there are lots of things that we don't know. For example, we don't know, you know parent or provider preferences or knowledge about each of them. We don't know the pattern of decision making. For example, you know, when is a decision made to put an IV in or an NG tube in? And how often are children switch from one to the other? Or, th or does a question even come up if an IV falls out? You know, should we rediscuss what's being done? There's also some limited data around um, certain high-risk groups. So the, the previous studies have excluded um, you know, premature infants or children under the age of one month. And these are really important groups that have some of the highest rates of hospitalization. But most important is that, that we don't know if parents are involved in decision making and, and whether the child is given um, IV or NG. So this specific study, and actually the primary outcome was purely um, decided and informed by our parent perspective. It's truly around understanding whether shared decision making happens. So there was a more recently developed tool called the Collaborate tool, which really seeks to understand how much were parents involved in decision making. And so we're going to aim to essentially ask parents or thinking about the conversation you had with their child's health care provider about giving extra fluids to your child. How much effort was made to help you understand your child's health issue? How much effort was made to listen to things that matter to you most? How much effort was made to include in what matters to you most and what to do next to truly understand what's currently happening 
for us to better be able to determine how we can improve shared decision making um, in the future. So another priority I wanted to, to give an example of is priority number two, which is what are methods of communication that are most effective between patients, carers, and healthcare providers on the general pediatric unit. Many of us know when it's self-evident that communication is essential and critical in hospital care, and many issues that come up often are because of poor communication. In our research network, we've also prioritized training and mentorship of new researchers and of individuals and encourage individuals to draw on their lived experience. This is a picture of Dr. Victor Doe, who's a pediatric resident um, at SickKids, who's leading a really important qualitative study in our network, which is focusing on how can we improve hospital care for children and families with limited English. Um, and the goal of this project is to learn from families and to find out how we can actually improve care. Um, and this is really drawing on Victor's personal experience of from his grandfather who spoke a different language. He designed the study, obtained funding for it, and launched this, um, which, is, which is being uh, connected at many communities in Ontario. But beyond the research projects, um, we have to also focus on communicating this agenda to improve the care of hospitalized children. You know, we've had the privilege of hearing the voice of families from across Canada and from clinicians, and we have now a responsibility to take what we've heard um, and to ensure that there's action um, towards addressing these top 10 questions which will only be accomplished really if individuals you know, beyond us and beyond our network can take these forward to address them. So with funding from the Ontario Sports Support Unit or OSU, we focused on developing dedicated knowledge translation outputs to help communicate these questions to others. For example, we developed a, a detailed research report which outlines our party setting partnership and for each of the questions provides a detailed background articulates the evidence gaps and provides us a list of a bunch of specific questions for someone to take on. And we also have a shortened executive summary. We've also created a detailed section on our PERN website, which is um, oh, free and accessible for anyone to, to see, which, which is accessible for the report, but also for each of the questions, we have a dedicated page, which similarly provides the background, the importance, the evidence gap, and a list of a bunch of questions that people can take forward. But we also recognize that many of the decisions um, are, come from decision makers, funders, knowledge users. So we organized a virtual roundtable session, which brought together communities with lived experience in hospital care. We had former patients, parents, and youth to determine how they wanted to see these top 10 questions operationalized in future research. And we specifically focused on three questions and developed a policy brief um, to better communicate the importance of addressing these questions to funding agencies and the government. So next I'll pass over to Francine to, to summarize our talk and outline some key resources for individuals who are interested in working with patient partners. So I hope um, we've sold you a bit on the value of engaging patients and families, and I hope now your, your interest is peaked enough to want to learn more. Um, so I'll give you a couple of tips um, to, to move forward if you are interested and want to learn more and want to build those relationships. Um, one great resource, um, and this resource is specifically targeted at uh, child health researchers and patient and family advisors interested in child health research, and it's called PORCH. It's the Patient Oriented Research Curriculum in Child Health. These are open and accessible to anyone. They are short training modules. They take about 20 minutes to do. And they go into depth on the importance of patient-oriented research and engagement and a little bit into how. So they're a great resource to share with um, your partners as well if you are already working with patients. My second piece of advice is to look out for patient engagement specialists, um, offices of patient engagement, or even just general hospital family advisory networks, or PFACs as they're called, the patient and family advisory committees. There are more and more institutions and more and more provincial and federal resources being directed at how we engage patients and families. There's more and more specialists like myself being hired on in different capacities. And they are there to help. They are there to share experiences from their past so that you can learn from what other groups are doing. 
reach out to look at articles for those that are already engaged in this work, even if it's outside your area of expertise. So if you've got a researcher that is working, say, in oncology, um, and you're working in a different area, you can still reach out and look for ways that they have engaged their patient partners and ways that they have really um, elevated that patient and family voice. That is independent or irregardless of the type of research that they're doing, how they get, engage parents and families is something we can share across research disciplines. So um, for example, here at SickKids, uh, we put out some resources, we put some you know, quick FAQs together to get you more um, information to know where to take the next step. So, the other thing I will say is you can reach out to me as well. My goal is to really elevate the patient and family voice. I'm always open to guiding anyone interested in doing this work. I think um, it, it is really meaningful and valuable work that makes research better. So if you do have a question, you want more support, feel free to reach out. I'll pass it back to you, Peter. Okay, and so we want to just thank everyone that comes to the end of our presentation, but it would, at first we want to just really acknowledge that, that this work is the reflection of, of a huge number of individuals and teams that have come together to make this possible. This is a photo of our most recent annual PERN meeting, and this past November it was really nice to reconnect. And this is you know, some of the many individuals that contributed to the Jane Lynn Alliance project to PERN and to our network. And this work is really a reflection of a community that we've grown and built um, that, that really see the value of patients as partners of, in terms of leading to improved outcomes for patients. So we would be delighted to take any questions and we'll just put up um, our, our email and name as well if anyone ever contact us and to see our PERN website and, then, um, and, our, and just thank our funders. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter and Francine, for this really engaging um, presentation. We've received a number of really positive comments about it that we'll share with you after the fact. And I see that um, our audience members have a few questions. So while I sort that out, um, we're going to um, issue another poll. And I just a little uh, reminder that you'll have to answer five questions before submitting your response. So while you're responding to that poll, I will um, pose, let's see some questions here. So Christina asked, can you describe why you decided to approach the James Lind Alliance to start the process? Were there other methods that you tried prior to joining the Alliance? Uh, thanks, that's a, really, that's a great question. And, and there are, and we had done a, a pretty detailed search and um, summarize the different methods. I didn't go through all that here. And, and I, I think that there was a few reasons. First, uh, it really, for, the, for what we understand and what I, I think is a really an, an exemplar method um, to work with patients um, and caregivers to identify research priorities. And I, you know, there's been over a hundred conducted internationally. And, and in the UK, for example, um, they are integral to identify funding calls for federal government, for federal funding opportunities. So I think it's really been acknowledged. There have been several done in Canada and we had talked to several individuals who had been involved with them um, before. Um, and then we had contacted Jane Lind Alliance. So I think it was, you know, several different, um, for several different reasons. One of the beneficial bits was that it's, it's a standardized process. So it's objective and transparent. I think we wanted to make sure that what we followed an, an approach that, that it's, has face validity. And so the output will be um, acceptable by you know, our community and that it engages the community together rather than having more of a, of a smaller of an ad hoc process. Um, and, but we also, you know, and honestly, we were fortunate to get funded to do it. It's not, it can be, it is a lot of work and it takes effort and time and, it's fun, and funding. And it would be difficult to do without funding. So had we not got funding, you know, we might've, you know, done a different approach, but I, I think it really is a, a fantastic process and I, just, I highly would recommend it. And, and the James Lind Alliance um, website and the resources in the UK, they, they'll guide and work with you um, to, to conduct one in the future. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, an anonymous um, poster says, Francine has a PhD. How can parents without academic experience um, participate? In it? Is it really for anybody? Maybe I'll tackle this one. So 
I went back to school after my son was born. Um, prior to that, I did not have, um, you know, any graduate studies in healthcare at all. But what I learned while I was in school is that it, the need is not there. There is, it is not necessary to have a PhD to engage. The inf what is necessary is access to researchers that are willing to listen, access to the um, the people able to take the insights from patients and families and apply it to that structure of the research network and the research process. So funding, grants, all that sort of stuff. And confidence building for patients and families to know that they don't need to speak the language. They don't need to have the jargony terms. They don't need to feel like they are inferior at these tables. And that's something that I'm really working on now is how do we build that confidence and provide that access so that you don't feel, and I felt the exact same way too, that I shouldn't be at this table. I don't deserve to be at this table because we all do deserve to be at this table. So, um, you know, speak to others that have come before you, um, learn from those that have done patient engagement as advisors before you, they will help you build your confidence and show you um, how to sit confidently at that table. Cause I think we all have the capacity to do that. We just need to be provided with the opportunity and told that we're invited there. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Jacqueline asks, could you provide any strategies to address equity, diversity, and inclusion principles when engaging with patients and families to ensure we're including a broad range of perspectives? So I'll tackle this one as well. So I think one step is you can do the transparent systematic methods, um, uh, like something like a James Lind Alliance. They are transparent. They are, you know, looking to find equity in terms of the balance in people that are attending in these sessions and things like that. However, whatever we invest to find diverse voices and a broad range of perspectives is meaningless if we're not listening and using those perspectives. So my advice is to always aim for diverse perspectives, but invest first in ensuring that the space you are inviting people into is a safe space, a space where they feel like they are being heard, a space where they feel like their voices matter. And often when we think about wanting to be diverse at our tables and bring equity to those tables, what we're not considering is why people are not coming. And often the problem is people are not coming to the table because they've either had traumatic experiences with the people that are also sitting at the table, that they don't feel that that table is a place that's willing to listen to them. So practice, 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 listening to your patients and families that you have access to, build safe environments with those patients you have access to, then broaden who you're giving access to at the table by considering why they're not coming, if you change something, why they might come, and think about having access to that table. So are you covering costs for child support? Are you make, holding meetings at times that are not during business hours if people are working? So think about how access to the table um, can be brought in to get more equity, diversity, and inclusion, but also why people don't want to sit at that table with you and share their ideas. Yeah, if both important perspectives. Yeah, and, yeah, and what I just don't comment, I, I think it's really important. And part of it is, is being aware and cognizant and attempting to address and ask so that was a lot of our initial feedback or my questions to our family advisor council is how do we you know identify you know patients and participants that are representative of the populations that we serve um but not just those that have volunteered their time and so part of it was just asking for help and how to do it and, it and it's different i think it's very geographic and regional what those what those communities are and i think some of the work I've shown like what Dr. Victor Doe is leading around families of limited English proficiency. Um, you know, how do we start to engage, you know, families that don't speak English? And part of that, sometimes that's driven by individuals that come from communities of interest that have, I think, relationships and are able to reach out and engage, you know, um, and rather than someone that has no linkage trying to make a connection that seems cold. So I, a part of it, uh, there's some of it that's organic, but I really, it's just being open 
around you know, how can we do it better and, and, and how do we make sure that we're being inclusive. Thank you. Uh, Christina asks, how can we recreate your success in other institutions? What are the key points in building a family research group? And uh, uh, similarly, Kristen asked, do you have suggestions for transferring these valuable principles and shared decision-making models into practice beyond the hospital, like home care or primary care? Chris, you take the first one, I can try the second one. So, at the beginning of this presentation, um, Pern really set forward some values of, and a vision. And a key part of that vision was to involve patients and families in the work that is being done with Pern. So the first step is to really embed the idea that the patient and family voice is valuable to the work that you're doing and make concrete connections of that value, right? Like really think through as a group how patient and family voices can build and make the work that you do better. If you haven't taken the time to do that, it's really hard when you're making little tiny decisions here and there, like what, uh, what funding to apply for, who to invite to be part of grants, who to sit at your advisory table, who to hire um, as employees within your group. Those decisions um, can veer away from your central value of wanting to include patients and family. So the first thing is to get support from um, those higher up in the organization that this is truly a, a goal of your organization and then work everything towards that. So if you're doing hiring committees, um, bringing in a patient and family advisor to sit on a hiring committee, um, bringing projects in front of faith, patient and family advisory groups, that gives your institution the concrete examples of why patients and families input is so valuable then you can slowly grow from there. So start small, make things concrete and visible and build on that success is my suggestion on how we can make things grow in other institutions. Yeah, and I agree. And I think that other point is just um, don't recreate the wheel, just ask others and look for others that have done it and ask for help and then ask to bring people in or, or you know, provide exemplars of, this has been done at this institution. How can we do it here? Because people always hate being compared to someone else that's that's doing something that that they're not. But it's more just a matter of the how. And it's and so sometimes it's very organic how it's developed with an institution that's not been artificial. The second question, I think, you know, we're we're very early on in our journey to in, embed shared decision making amongst other issues into the routine care. I mean, part of this is trying to understand how do we do it and, and how do we do it in a way that's Know, pragmatic and part of care. And I think in many ways, you know, Perno Network is what we call a learning health system. Like we're all practitioners that are taking care of patients and we're also doing the research, but the research directly applies to our patients. We, we, we really have a living lab and we really try and, you know, really think about how we can actually improve care, you know, when I go to see patients next week. And so I think it's, we're just trying incrementally finding topics that are of, you know, big health system burden, topics that are relevant. And then that, that's the projects that we're trying to do, figure out how to do that. And I think it's just finding specific examples, illustrating it, and then trying to scale up. But we're certainly, I wish I had a solution to that question now, but maybe in a couple of years, we can, can ask me that again and have a better answer. But I think it's um, it's a work in progress. It's also creating a community of individuals that see the value in it and grow. Thank you. I think this will be our, our last question for the session. Um, Fadia is a parent looking for opportunities to be part of research to benefit her child as well as other families in similar circumstances. Where does she start? Reach out. <laughs> I'm happy to speak to you about different opportunities. There are growing networks across the country um, and there are these growing communities of patient and family advisors that are supporting other patient and family advisors. Um, there's a saying in the community where we, you know, open the door so that someone can walk in behind us. Um, and there's lots of patients and families that um, are happy to share their learnings to help guide new patient, new advisors um, on the start of their journey. So it, it is really dependent on where your experiences are, what your interests are, how you want to engage and feel that you can contribute. And all that comes from just having conversations with a lot of advisors that have come before you. So please do reach out to me. Um, my email is on the screen and um, I'm happy to chat. 
Thank you so much. Um, that's the end of our time together today. Uh, thank you to Peter and Francine for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thanks for the audience for joining in. We know you're all very busy and uh, we appreciate you sharing your time and expertise as well. Uh, upcoming on Spark Conversations, our podcast series, uh, the next episode is coming out on February 27th. It's Child Health Research, Thinking Outside the Typical Healthcare System Box, where Dr. Jason Berman will be uh, interviewed by Dr. Smart, our uh, podcast host. In Spark Live, the webinar series on February 23rd, National Kids and Vaccines Day, we're excited to bring you another webinar on improving vaccine uptake, prioritizing pain and fear management during the immunization experience. And next month, March, the Spark theme is child health in the media. And we're excited to bring you a whole other uh, Spark Live, uh, two webinars and a podcast. Uh, stay tuned for more details. Always great if you can watch live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't, the recordings are available, af made available on our website after the session. So check back to childhealthcan.ca. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you to Peter and Francine for the presentation. And hopefully we'll see many of you back here next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>